Hello, uh, now that it's uh, 12 o'clock uh, Eastern Standard Time and 9 Pacific Time, uh, we'd like to get our, our webinar started here. My name is Roger LeMaine. I'm the President and CEO of UX Corporation. I'm joining you here live from our offices in Saskatoon. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to come in and, and listen to what we are up to this, up this summer and what we've been doing over the last year. And uh, for those of you who aren't here and don't hear it live, uh, of course, we're going to have this be posted on our webinar. This webinar, excuse me, will be posted on our website here later on today. Uh, without any further ado, I'd like to thank the people who were at our last webinar a couple of months ago for your suggestions and, and the support that you'd like to see us do more of these. Uh, we've tried to incorporate as many of those as we can uh, into this particular session. Uh, for those of you online, uh, we will be answering questions. Uh, the format we'd like to follow is that uh, I'll give you a little bit of a brief presentation on what uh, is happening with the, your company and with the cobalt and uranium markets. Uh, you'll notice on your tab at uh, the top of the screen uh, with, with the particular software package, there's a Q&A tab. If you have a question, please uh, click on that tab, type in your question, and I will answer those. Hopefully, I'll be answering those as during the presentation, but if I don't, actually hit on that particular question. We'll go through uh, your questions here at the end of the presentation. Uh, so without further ado, with I've got some fair number of participants online, we'll get started uh, with an update on our 2019 programs in the uranium and cobalt markets. Uh, for those of you that we're doing, we will be having some forward-looking statements, so I'd like you to review this very carefully and realize that uh, we'll be relying on our forward-looking statements. Uh, UX's biggest competitive advantage is our location and our experience. We're located, all of our assets are located in Saskatchewan's Athabasca Basin. It's the number three global mining investment jurisdiction according to the Fraser Institute, but it's the world's number one jurisdiction from Fraser Institute's policy perception index. We have very mining friendly stakeholders in our backyard where we work. Uh, we're very scrap of infrastructure and it's been a historically a low cost world class rating district. Our team, while we're very small, we have we punch a little bit above our weight. We have extensive experience in making actual discoveries that some of them have actually been in, in the mining stage. But we also have a unique under, understanding of the cobalt and nickel deposits, as well as our very unique understanding of, of uranium deposits as well. This map here is, is a map of the Athabasca Basin. It shows all 20 of our projects. You can see we're focused. We have 11 projects in the Western Athabasca Basin where we have uh, eight joint venture projects with Ariba, one joint venture project with Ariba and JCU, and a couple of our own projects. We have our you know, historically strong focus in the eastern Athabasca Basin and right in the middle of all the uranium mines uh, on our Hidden Bay, Horseshoe, Raven, and Christie projects. We have three projects on the north side of the basin here and along the rim, and a brand new project on the south side. And we'll get into more of those as we move forward. Uh, UEX, one of the oldest established uranium junior companies in the world, uh, established in 2001. We own 10 uranium deposits or a portion thereof. We have just under 100 million pounds in resources and extensive land package. And it's been the core assets that have supported this company for, for several, several years. Uh, re in a couple of years ago, we formed COEX Metals, our 100% owned subsidiary, to look at our cobalt assets. And we have one of the few, in fact, one of the only primary Canadian cobalt resources at a very low discovery cost. But we think the really interesting part is we have several priority prospects on our land package. And we have a unique understanding of what to look for because nobody else has been looking for these cobalt deposits. We'll focus our start of the presentation on technical end on, on the uranium deposits uh, end of what we're doing. Uh, so, but first we'll, we'll take a little peek into the uranium markets. Uh, what's driving uh, in things in the Western world particularly uh, greenhouse gas emissions. You can see the nuclear power from this chart here on a, on a per gigawatt hour of production of electricity has one of the lowest, if not, you know, right in the lowest group of, of uh, carbon emissions, way lower than people would imagine than even with solar power. And of course, about 20 times lower than the natural gas, which is, seems to be the most favorable new uh, base load source of electricity. Uh, uranium market trends. The one thing that's that's certain is that the low prices that we've seen in uranium over the last couple of years are completely unsustainable for the entire nuclear power industry uh, and the uranium industry. You know, everyone can't afford to lose money forever, uh, despite what people may believe. Uh, this cannot happen forever because there's no investment going into the space. 
Uh, most of 2019 has been a challenge when it comes to waiting for the markets to, to change. Industry participants uh, in electrical utilities weren't buying sell, uh, uranium because they were waiting for the, the United States Section 232 petition to decision to be made. Uh, that decision was made about a month ago here in the middle of July. Uh, but unfortunately, the market hasn't reacted only because the uh, White House decided to put together the working group to provide recommendations. While they didn't believe that Iranian imports were causing a problem in the United States, the, uh, they do believe it's a security or a, a national security issue. And so they've been putting together a working group here that reports in mid-October. Utilities not wanting to be afoul of any particular rules have started have had to wait on the sidelines. So our, you know, we were hoping that uh, in July that the world would get back to normal contracting, that we're gonna have to wait till mid-October to see that probably happen. Uh, our Japanese restarts are happening at a much slower pace than we expected and becoming a little more costly. So uh, as a catalyst for the industry, uh, moving forward on a growth curve, I think we have to be very cautious with the approach what Japan might be doing. Uh, but that being said, reactor builds are still happening at a, you know almost unprecedented pace since the 1970s, and that will mean demand growth. But what is happening is that growth isn't happening in our backyard. It's happening in developing countries who are looking for base load electricity. In 2017, 2018, you're starting to see supply discipline from the bigger players. We're seeing production down a little bit to cut into that uranium surplus that's out there. And uh, the experts are still saying that the, that surplus is very small and, and diminishing very rapidly. Probably the most important thing about uranium market trends is the current underinvestment in both nuclear energy and in uranium uh, deposit developments will impact the industry over the long term. Because people aren't investing, there isn't return on capital in the current prices of uranium. People are avoiding in the space, but that can't happen indefinitely without impacting the industry. We believe that's about to change. Uh, right now, for 443 operable reactors, about 410 of them in, 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 in production today, uh, but 55 more are construction and several more planned. Uh, you see China just recently announced uh, the, the acceleration of their programs in, in, in domestically. Um, U.S. is still the largest uh, consumer of, of uranium and nuclear power operator in the world, although there is some risk of about 10 to 12 reactors to potential early retirements. But China is building and putting into production six to eight per year. Uh, there will be a need as, as the, those 55 reactors come into uh, production for increased uranium. Like I said, 55 reactors under construction. You can see China, India, and the UAE are leading the way with several groups, like including uh, uh, South Korea and such, in for a bunch of reactors as well, Russia. But it's happening in places where there are base leads for baseload electricity uh, that are low cost and particularly uh, low carbon emissions. This graph shows you the uranium prices from 2004 to 2019. You can see in the, in the late 2007. The, the price spike of uranium prices up to about $135 a pound. You can see in 2011, the spike that would happen that, uh, around the Fukushima event. You can see over the last three years, uranium, three to four years, uranium prices have been, been relatively flat. Just looking at Cameco's second quarter results and just sort of inferring what their cost of production is at just over $40 a pound, you can see Cameco being one of the world's lowest cost producers can't make money at today's uranium prices. And if they're one of the lowest cost quartel producers, we're not sure how long this can last before there's irreparable, irreparable damage to the industry. We believe that even though that uranium utilities, uranium utilities are cautious about buying today until they see what happens in the United States with the working group, we think that there might be a slight oversupply in the market that's that may have disappeared this year or maybe disappearing in the next couple of years. The reality is it takes a decade or more to put a uranium mine in production. So if that investment is not happening today, all we're going to do is increase volatility in the future when though that uranium is needed because we're not investing in it today for that decade out. So we think for uranium investors, this is a very good position time to be in the, in the uranium space. So focusing in on our projects, you know, well, we have just under 100 million pounds of uranium resources. Our goal is to double our production or, or double, not production, double our resources over a period of time here, because we believe that the company will become more valuable as uranium prices increase, the amount of resources, and given that uranium companies on the upswing get valued on the resource they have in the ground, we believe we're well positioned to take advantage of that. And we have great opportunities to grow. Um, 
focusing uh, this year uh, in the winter and summer, our focused and flagship uranium product is Christie Lake. Uh, we are doing some work at Hidden Bay in the summer and at Shea Creek uh, on a pillar, and uh, be cautious with that. We have our Raven Horseshoe deposit in the wings waiting for uh, prices to improve so that we can move that project into development. So looking at Christie Lake, uh, last uh, winter we gave out our maiden resource estimate on the property. We focused in a very, very small area in that little box on the right-hand side. You know, what we love about this project, not only is it the only junior land package between the two world's largest the highest grade uranium mines cigar lake in uh, macarthur river we've only tested a fraction of what we were anticipating when we picked up this project three years ago and we're pretty excited about some of what we've been able to accomplish over the year that this past year that will help us with growing the deposit deposit resource base that we have there now and i'll sort of move on here to the, to the next slide we focused a Almost all of our exploration work since 2016 in this very small area up here in the north end of the property where the known deposits were. Uh, we've managed to improve our confidence in those deposits and made the Aurora discovery. But we've come to, you know, in 2019, our focus is going to shift a little bit away from adding incremental pounds around the existing deposits within the footprint of the existing deposits to looking for the next lens of deposits. And with that in mind, uh, we started the two phase exploration program. This winter's phase one program had a $750,000 budget and it focused on DC resistivity, which is a geophysical method that helps identify potential conductivity and alteration in both the sandstone column overlying the uranium deposits and then the basement. Sandstone particularly is very resistive. So in this map on the left-hand side, you see there are lots of hot uh, red and magenta colors of the sandstone being extremely resistive just above the unconformity, but you also see little trends of, of cooler, greener, and yellower colors, which indicate conductivity in the sandstone, which is potentially related to alteration. And so um, what, what this survey, we just got the preliminary results for, and we're still putting together the final interpretation of, shows us four really areas of interest. We covered the uranium deposits themselves because we wanted to see if we could see a signature on other parts of the property. Uh, related to this type of survey, and I think we have seen that. Uh, we found a very interesting anomaly in the south where there's absolutely no drilling uh, on the south end of this property. It's one of the key grassroots ends of the project that we're very excited about. Um, and that target's known as the south trend. We found uh, on the next step of the yellow egg trend back towards the P2 fault structure that hosts all the MacArthur mineralization, that they called the B trend. We found an incredibly interesting anomaly that we were going to follow up here this summer. And then actually probably what excites us the most is this offset in the connectivity on Aurora North. And we'll get more into those here in the next minute or two. Focusing in on that north area around the deposits, you can see the Aurora deposit, Ken Penn and Paul Bay deposits are right here. And you can see this is the resistivity background again. And you can see the cooler colors being more uh, or less resistive, which is possibly indicative of both graphitic mineral uh, graphite in the basement and alteration in the basement and sandstone column, you can see that around Ken Penn and Paul Bay, there's a very prominent resistivity low, which is pretty interesting. We see that same low over here to the southwest on the B conductor trend, which is here in, in red, and there's sniffs of mineralization on that trend in the past. We also see going to the north that the aurora, uh, the, 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 uh, so the, excuse me, the resistivity low associated with the deposits actually seems to be offset to the north. And that was quite a surprise because we weren't expecting that. What we've done to make the Aurora discovery and around the property with great success is following up on PNC's early work where they got sniffs of mineralization uh, that people go, oh, maybe not too excited about, uh, but we followed up and turned it into something. So one of the one of the great examples here is whole CB49 drilled back uh, in the late 1980s by PNC. And it had a sniff of mineralization about 50, just a little over 50 meters below the unconforming. And uh, while there's been holes drilled along strike, people weren't very excited about this from the historical operator's point of view. We've gone back and looked at the, the, the system and realized that that was the new drill up dip of that in 2018, 2017, and made the Aurora discovery, which you can see that same hole sits right here, just a tip of the Aurora discovery. We think, you know, what we weren't expecting when we picked up this property is that these types of opportunities would exist and turn into something. 
Um, so what we've done is when you're looking at our targeting priority is look for SNPs of isolated mineralization like this or anomalous rate activity that haven't been tested at the classic nonconformity setting, which um, strangely enough, we were surprised wasn't tested because they didn't, the, the struct, there's a slight change in the, the model that we're, that we're following up on being very successful. But when we look back at the north end, we have our deposit areas. And what's interesting, we have that resistivity low that's, that's associated off with graphite and alteration and a sniff of the hole here, a hole uh, CB48, or excuse me, you know, that has intersected mineralization of uranium, cobalt, and nickel about 50 meters below the end conformity and hasn't been followed up. Likewise, just southwest in the boat, uh, 500, 600 meters southwest in the long trend of the, the existing deposits, we have another hole, similar mineralization in two locations just below the end conformity that haven't been followed up to its sort of classic projection of where that structure would hit the anchor for me, which is shown in these dotted lines here. So those two areas are gonna be high priority work for our upcoming, and uh, upcoming and actually just started exploration program this summer. And you can kind of see, well, there's been an incredible amount of work done drilling around the deposit areas and along the strike to the north east. Very little work done to the south and west along strike. And here's where CD83 happens to exist. And if it's similar, we're expecting things to potentially plunge into the basement here, or even not even tested yet at the unconformity. What probably interested us the most from the resistivity survey was the Aurora North offset area. So we once again we have the Aurora deposit, the Ken Penn deposit, and Paul Bay deposit. And over the last year or so, we've been testing and have been successfully testing. A fault structure that hosts Aurora along strike to the northeast, seen here in the purple dotted line. But we noticed that the intensity of the alteration reactivity dropped off quite dramatically just as we got outside to the northeast of the Aurora deposit. And we couldn't really understand why. We know there is an interesting hole on the, across the property boundary on the adjacent property. We didn't really understand it until we did this resistivity survey. And now it looks like we might see an offset of the perspective structures and stratigraphy just to the north, about 175 meters. So you can see there by the pink line that that uh, resistivity low continues. We'll be testing that here with our upcoming drill program as well. So our 2019 exploration program on Tuesday, we announced uh, our phase two program, the $2 million budget. We're gonna be doing 12 to 15 holes in the 8,000 meter area. We're focusing in the green areas, uh, up dip of that mineralization, coincident with the resistivity anomaly in the B target area over here. Testing up dip and down dip with the C83 mineralization along strike of the existing deposit to the southwest along the sea conductor and testing holes up in that Aurora North area. And our program that we announced on Tuesday is underway. We expect that program to be finished in early October. And as results come out, we'll, we'll update the market. So the three areas of interest, and once again, the B zone anomaly and, and, and such. Moving over to the Hidden Bay property on the eastern side of the, of the Athabasca Basin, you can see here is the Hidden Bay property. It surrounds our Horseshoe Raven project. It butts the north end of our West Bear project. And it's east of Cigar and immediately on the boundaries with, with uh, McLean Lake and surrounds the Rabbit Lake property. It's got less than 150 meters of sandstone cover, very, very shallow. And what we like about it is it's the basement hosted advantage. Uh, most of the work done has, by previous operators on the property outside the areas that UX has worked has focused on testing the structure at the unconformity for a classic unconformity cigar lake West Bear style deposit. Even though basement mineralization you see in red down that structure uh, wouldn't be tested by those types of programs. Yet all the most recent discoveries like Eagle Point 02 or North Extension, Millennium, Griffin, uh, the Rabbit Lake Pit itself, uh, Rough Rider and Arrow would all be mineralization located below that box of investigation done by the past. What we do know is that those basic mineralized intersections you see below that box do have geological expressions up inside the box. And what we've been doing is looking for hot spots where we've got unexplained anomalous rate activity or hydrothermal alteration that was tested at the unconformity but not at depth. And what we've been focusing on over the last couple of years is building up a target inventory from the, the reviewing the old drill core where they weren't focused on looking for those features uh, and testing them for both uranium and actually strength of cobalt and nickel potential as well. One of the things we've done different uh, this year as we build up a for program for potentially 2020 or 2021 at Hidden Bay is we look at one of the enigmas that has bothered 
our team for the last uh, little while, and that's up in the Sioux telephone area, which immediately is adjacent to Arado's McLean Lake operation. And this year we did a Lindsay see in blue a radon survey in that area. But what intrigues us is that Sioux telephone area, you can just see here's the property boundary. Uh, to the north here is the is McLean Lake mine and the big hole in the ground here is the open pit for the sea, the uh, straight for the E deposit that was mined out here a couple of years ago. You can see the trend called the Sioux trend that followed, goes south from there. And you can see that UX and previous operators drilled some, some holes in this area and unfortunately I'm able to find mineralization. We know that the SUE is the southernmost of a trend of, of five uranium deposits that extend over just under 1.7 kilometers to the north. Uh, we know that we, there's another structure right over here uh, to, the, to the west called the telephone structure and actually around the corner and up over in this area here, the telephone structure has the McLean Lake South deposit. And we've got snips of mineralization here, but we haven't been able to put together a deposit. But, it's been bothering us why the mineralization would end so quickly here and the alterations such would be the same. So we've been think, doing some thinking about this area and this is sort of a schematic cartoon of, of the neighborhood where we have the five deposits, at the two deposits that have been mined as part of the McLean Lake operation. And you can see there's been a large, there's a, this is the graphitic fault structure that hosts or is associated with those deposits. And there's a large offset on that fault structure all the way down to and just to the property boundary. And then that offset seems to disappear. But strangely enough, on the western side of this corridor, on the telephone fault structure, we see large offsets of the end conformity. And then as soon as it gets crude close to the property boundary, the other offsets disappear. And this doesn't make sense. We would say that what's happening is that this block on the right hand side is being pushed up and over top of the sandstone, the basement rocks over the sandstone from a east to west direction. But there's no, it doesn't make sense that it would be moving extensively here and over here, but not in this area or in this area. Unless, of course, the strain is being, trans is being transferred by cross-cutting fault structures. Uh, and it's fun, odd because they, they sort of point towards where our SNPs and mineralization are. Now, this isn't the typical graphitic package unconformity play that you'd see, but this, isn't, this kind of situation isn't unprecedented. In fact, our team has experience at Eagle Point finding the O2 next some of the other deposits are found in just such a location like this. The challenge with these deposits is they're hard to image using the classical uh, electromagnetic and resistivity techniques, and particularly in this area when we have an open pit over here, power lines going through, uh, we aren't able to use some of the newer techniques that we'd like to use here to help try to image these cross-cutting structures. So we've gone back to a new version of old school using radon, and we know that radon it emanates from uranium deposits as part of the decay of uranium uh, into lead. And so what we're looking for is potentially uranium coming off the, or sorry, radon coming off of your potentially uranium deposit up these fault structures and be detected in the subsurface. So we've just completed a radon survey and we're just getting the, the results here uh, today. And the idea would be looking for potential cross cutting fault structures that would, would suggest that the uh, alteration in the system associated with the Sioux deposit would come down the Sioux trend along these cross-cutting faults and back down the telephone trend and form a deposit in this area. So that's what we're speculating. That we we're hoping to see with the radon survey is evidence that that's happened and I will keep you in tune as what happens with that results as we receive them. Over at Shea Creek, uh, as, as you know, Shea Creek uh, was discovered, uh, most of the resources were discovered with uh, our option money going into Shea Creek back in 2003, 2008, uh, nine. And unfortunately, our partner, Reba, who owns 40 or 50, just a little over majority here, uh, has been going through a, through a rough time in the property. Uh, the project has stalled over the last couple of years. Um, but there is substantial resources there, and we believe the potential for, for increasing within the footprint of the deposits themselves. Uh, those of you who were here last time saw this slide. You can see the, the mineralization here. This is the wireframe of the resources. In red here is the classic unconformity mineralization. It occurs right at the basement in the sandstone interface. And blue, yellow, and green are basement mineralization, which is for some of the higher grades and, and better, to, uh, more interesting uh, parts of the resource sit here over at Canna. And you can see that not everywhere under the red is, is blue. And we think that's because it has not so much that it has been tested for, but it hasn't been tested for. And we've been going through our, you know, our database of, of knowledge and, and geology and trying to find locations where the Canna style basement mineralization opportunities have been missed below uh, the rest of the deposits. And we think we found a few of those and over the next couple of weeks we'll be up at site sort of proving up 
uh, what we see on paper with what we see on uh, uh, in the actual core and seeing if we can develop a whole series of targets that we can use to grow the Shea Creek deposits and working with our partner around out to towards the program probably in 2021 to see us move that property forward and grow the resource there. So shifting gears, uh, that's what we're doing and have been doing this year over at uh, on our uranium assets. We've done some extensive work this winter and summer on, on our West Bear Cobalt project. Uh, we've added two cobalt projects here over the last couple of uh, months through staking. We'll tell you a little bit about uh, what we're doing at, at West Bear in our cobalt project. But first, we'll focus on uh, on cobalt. Uh, once again, if you were here last time, you saw this slide. Uh, it's striking because while there's cobalt produced all over the world, it's dominantly produced in the DRC, uh, almost 60%, and that was forecast to go up to as much as 75% in the next couple of years. Uh, all of that, it's now in question. Recent developments in the cobalt industry, uh, EV adoption rates continue to meet even the craziest uh, uh, forecasts and recommendations. Uh, we're seeing EV adoption happening faster and faster on an exponential basis. It's still a small part of the overall automobile market, but we're seeing companies pile into the space. Uh, over the last few months in 2019, we're seeing mergers and acquisitions of cobalt developers that are located outside the DRC with two, one, one in progress and another one just recently completed. But probably most importantly, um, when, the, when the cobalt market started to really take off, we saw companies start to forecast uh, massive growth of DRC-based mines, uh, Katanga being one of them. Um, and we're seeing that those, those ramp ups at Katanga are slower than expected. They're, they're going at half the pace than they were expecting. And with these forecasts uh, going into the end of 2018, uh, the analysts were predicting that it'd be a, co a cobalt surplus for a couple of years while these projects have ramped up. And what we're seeing is that maybe that's not the case. The Katanga ramp up was slower. It's, it's not only that, uh, we've had issues with, uh, with the uranium contamination of the cobalt that they were gonna clean up here by the first half of this year. Now it's still uh, forecast to be only a year away. So this glut of cobalt that was supposed to hit the market in late 2019, 2020, it's probably not gonna happen, especially with combined with Glencore's decision to shutter the world's largest cobalt mine, Matanga, by uh, the end of the year. And Matanga itself produced 20% of their global supply. So with Katanga and Matanga, or Katanga and Matana put together, they were going to be about some between 35 and 40% of the world supply. And that sort of slowed down. We're seeing challenges in, in the DRC with uh, you know, highlighted by unfortunately the death of 43 miners at the pit wall or our traditional miners at the count at the Glencore Katanga's Kamado operations, just highlighting the challenges related to the industry and how highly dependent it is on the DRC. But what do we know? The, the 7,000 tons of oversupply that was forecast for 2019, 2020 is probably no longer a reality. Meanwhile, experts like Benchmark Minerals are forecasting gigafactory developments of, of adding about one ter terawatt hour worth of capacity over the next decade. This year alone, 300, almost a third of that was, was announced as new build gigafactories this year. Supply from the DRC continues to be plagued by safety, human rights, and ethical challenges. Meanwhile, current companies like Volkswagen, Ford, and even Toyota just very recently are starting to pile into the EV space. Um, and cobalt, demand is still, cobalt demand is still expected to double by 2026. So we saw when the Tang announcement came out a couple weeks ago, the immediate short, quick response in the, in the uh, cobalt price. I think people are still waiting to see where that's gonna go. Uh, but quite frankly, there's a dire need for more the world needs more stable, ethically sourced cobalt, and I think that's where uh, UEX and COEX come into play. So shifting gears, looking at the, the West Bear project, uh, it's down the southern part of the, our land pack, incentive land package holding right on the margin of the basin, of the of East Athabasca Basin. Uh, we did an extensive uh, $4 million program this year to grow the, the resource that we developed last year, which is here in purple, that, that uh, 3 million pounds of cobalt in that purple area there, and the, you can see the drilling dots here show you all the drilling that was done this past year and in 2020, in 2018, excuse me. And we've been able to take that deposit. We've been managed to find some more high grade intersections, but probably more importantly, expand that deposit out to about a 650 meter strike length uh, from its previous 200 meter strike length and, and grow it up dip to the end conformity. Uh, and we're per currently in the process of 
and sort of reevaluating the size of the deposit. Uh, we do know that uh, that the grades as we go west were a little bit lower and is more nickel rich versus cobalt rich, uh, but we're still working on that interpretation as we speak. What excites us about the immediate neighborhood is is the area just to the north of, of West Bear, uh, known as the the north rim of the West Bear Dome, and particularly we've been working this summer on growing our target inventory by looking at stuff we've seen on paper, checking it with core that we found over the last year while we're in. Uh, sort of sequestered out in the bush uh, and looking at some of those uh, to see if we can improve our targeting. And one of the areas that popped out the most interesting was that Umperville target located immediately, about two, no, two kilometers immediately north of the West Bear area. You know, terrain geologically it looks very similar to the trap that forms West Bear. And what excites us here are two cross sections located about 1200 feet or 350 meters apart where work was done in 1977 focused exclusively on finding uranium. Uh, and yet we're seeing strong alteration in the basement uh, on, whole, on this one particular section. We're getting mineralization in uranium, but they didn't sample for nickel and never analyzed for cobalt, with the exception of a handful of samples, spot samples here or there, where they hit mineralization. They've got anomalous nickel in the sandstone and around uranium mineralization. And the holes to follow it up in the down dip direction of the structure actually died in 1977. They lost the last bit of core in that box there, so they never actually were able to see what happened at the end conforming. And particularly the holes died in strong clay alterations, suggesting the system was open into the southwest and down dip direction. Same thing over here at 1200 feet to the east. We're getting an almost rate of activity, 500 ppm of nickel through here in spot samples and complete the structure that we're expanding is gonna come through either here or, or even another one parallel over here. Needs more work. There are no holes, only one hole between these two fences 1,200 feet apart and no holes to the southwest for 600 meters and to the northwest for, for 1,800 meters. And that's a lot of room to fit more West Bear type deposits in there. Once again, uh, if you were here last time, you saw us talk about these deposits. They don't, these cobalt deposits we're seeing in the Athabasca Basin aren't the typical deposits you see elsewhere in the world. It's a new class of deposit. Uh, and we're still trying to figure out what they look like, but we do believe that we have got several pieces of the elephant that are helping us describe what we're looking for. And it gives us a competitive advantage for cobalt in the Athabasca Basin for the foreseeable future. As I mentioned before, we added two cobalt projects this year. Our, our, go, our goal is to look for cobalt deposits in the shallow portions of the basin where they're open pitable. Kind of like redefining the uranium strategy was 40 years ago, where would you look? Shallow portions where the cost of, of, of exploration is cheaper, taking advantage of existing drill work that was done in the past and we get a vector towards these cobalt deposits and we want them to be open pit exploitable. So we've picked up some land here just north of our Black Lake project called at Axis Lake where there's been known <clears throat> nickel copper uh, mineralization that has periodically sampled for cobalt and we're, we'll be, it's a grassroots project we just picked up a couple months ago and we're looking at that. And also down here on the south side, the, uh, the Key West project which was land previously owned by and part of Chemicals Key Lake operation where we see boulders and such that show us there's an almost nickel, uh, copper, and uranium in this area, where we think there's perspective for cobalt deposits as well. But we just started picking up property in that area and we're just starting to evaluate them. So these will be our longer term plug, grassroots plays that will go into our cobalt assets. So on the horizon, we've just started our summer drill program at Christie Lake with the idea of discovering new lenses and mineralization. We are really excited about what we're going to see on the B zone trend just some southwest of Paul Bay, and particularly on that Aurora North offset trend, and we're we'll drilling those here as we speak. Uh, we're, we're completing the act, the new evaluation of the West Bear deposit, and we've been working on growing, uh, or sorry, identifying and permitting targets for the north rim of the dome, which will occur. The testing arrow can occur because it's wet, probably not till the uh, till the next winter's program. At Hidden Bay, building a program to to define exploration targets for upcoming drill programs and doing that radon survey to see if we can detect uh, mineralization south of the sea deposits. And yes, we're still looking at cobalt value. I know shareholders are very eager to see that spin out go, but the spin out has, you know, or the valuation of that asset, how are we making that? That has to work for all shareholders, not just a quick hit and something that just dies on the vine. We realized that we were wanting to do the spin out. We announced the spin out that we were planning to do it. We really, and unfortunately, the markets have conspired against our ability to get that done in a way that makes a cobalt asset sustainable. 
And so we're still monitoring that. We think with the supply discipline that's coming into the cobalt space and with the need for more non-DRC-based cobalt and some mergers and acquisitions coming out, that that opportunity is, com is coming closer or sooner. We can create that value that's sustainable uh, as opposed to just a quick flash in the pan, then we'll pull the trigger and make that happen. But until those conditions are there, it doesn't create make much sense for shareholders to see that cobalt, those cobalt assets orphaned somewhere. And so we're continuing, and we monitor this pretty much every day. So in summary, uh, we uh, this is last week's uh, number, or end of the month numbers here. Uh, we're it's about a $60 million company. Uh, our chemical is still our largest shareholder, and Steve Sorensen, our CEO, our former founding CEO, excuse me, still one of the largest shareholders in the company. Uh, we have great uranium assets that we're working on and growing and we were one of the most unique cobalt company opportunities you can get out there so with that in mind i'm going to turn it over to any questions um, please if you have a question please submit them uh, you, by clicking on the q a tab uh, banner and that will fo focus you on having questions i don't see any here right now i have some questions from from, from others that have been posted to people who couldn't attend the webinar but wanted to have a question answered uh, first question I have here, um, reported by Reuters, cobalt is to rise 60%, perhaps more in the next 18 months. With that information, does that change management strategy moving forward? And the answer is uh, yes and no. And what I mean by that is, yes, we're looking for the right opportunity to, to do something to monetize that value of cobalt, the cobalt assets for shareholders. And if cobalt rises, that will certainly make it a whole lot easier. But we're looking to do that as soon as we possibly can. So yes, um, uh, it does, but it's sort of I mean, that's part of the catalyst to make that happen. Um, other question I have here. Uh, speaking of other UX's other resources, could we have an update on gold at Shea Creek and elsewhere? Uh, any plans to take advantage of the high gold price? Uh, we do know there is gold at Shea Creek. Um, it, it's not millions of ounces. It's not hundreds of thousands of ounces. It's a couple of tens of ounces, tens of thousands of ounces of gold. So until, you know, quite frankly, it's going to, if, if it ever were developed at all, it's a pretty small gold asset. So I can't see it being something that would, uh, would change our strategy whatsoever. Um, question here from, and by the way, um, one of the comments we had uh, during the last Q&A session was that people were either happy or not happy to be anonymous. So if you wish to be anonymous, you post your question, please say so. Otherwise, I will tell your name. I have a Question here from Max Trojan. Is there any chance your cobalt nickel deposits located at Christie Lake get rolled into coax? Um, the question right now, I don't foresee that happening unless the cobalt assets get to be very big. We have a single intersection with cobalt and nickel on a midterm or no, sorry, mid stage opportunity at the B trend. So I don't believe that it's going to go into coax at this point in time because we have, we'd have to overwhelm the amount of uranium resources we have there and the uranium potential. But if that does happen, then we would reevaluate. Uh, okay, I think I don't have any other questions right now that, uh, oh, do, sorry, I have one more here from, uh, from a previous thing. In terms of uh, raising money in the 2020s, have you explored the possibility of using debt to keep shareholders from being diluted? Uh, I think it's highly unlikely that your board and, and the management team would would consider uh, raising debt when we don't have yet revenue coming in. It's extremely dangerous and, can, and at the end of the long run, it can be extremely dilutive to shareholders. So I don't think that's likely going to happen. Uh, when do we expect an update from on 43101 reserves at West Bear? I'm anticipating that will come at the end of the fourth quarter at the earliest at this point in time only because our team has been focused completely on getting the stuff from Christie done and our Hidden Bay stuff done uh, in the last little bit. And we do expect that it's gonna be a busy season for our um, consultant to be able to help us get to the finish line. Uh, so I would expect it to be late, late in the year at the earliest. Okay, are there any other questions that have come in? Um, Oh, one more here. I got uh, how long from Max? How long will your cash last? Uh, right now, uh, from a hard dollar point of view, to, for for GNA, UX is funded through to the end of next year fairly easily. Uh, what will be in our programs? We have money here for our current programs, 
uh, from a flow through perspective that we will have to spend by the end of the year, which is why you're seeing that money going into, into the drill program at, at Christie Lake. Uh, next year's programs, uh, there's, there's only gonna be a handful of, or a little bit of money to do programs for next year's work. So uh, the focus on how much energy, how much effort gets put in will be, will be dependent upon what the market does. If uranium starts to move, cobalt starts to move, we'll, we'll reconsider things, but it'll be a fairly, um, um, as we've always done, been fairly conservative with our approach to what we do in 2020. Okay. Uh, I don't see any other questions at this point in time. So with that, uh, if there are no other questions, I think um, we will uh, end the webinar now. Uh, if you can let people know that there will be this webinar will be posted on the, on our website here, and there'll be news going out about that, so that people can connect to it. Uh, if you have any feedback, uh, please send it to uex at uex dot or uex dash corporation dot com. If you have things you'd like to see us do more of or less of during these webinars, or if you find them productive at all. Anyways, I thank you for your time. It's been uh, I appreciate you those of you in the east taking your lunch hour to to hear our story and what we're up to. And I look forward to updating you guys in the near future about uh, our continued activities. Thank you very much. <laughs>